Hello, can you hear me? How are you doing? Good, 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 great to be here. Um, as we all know, there's so many people talking about Gaza. There's so many people, so many writers, so many journalists, so many academics talking about Gaza. Um, and even I, I, I grew up in Jerusalem, it's about an hour and a half drive, and I talk about Gaza a lot. I talk about how it's an open air prison. Sometimes people will even say that it's a concentration camp, how there is two million people besieged, blockaded, without the ability to leave, um, to go anywhere, without the right to movement, without access to clean water, how Gaza has been declared uninhabitable by the United Nations. And I say this, and I repeat this, I say they've been under siege for six, 16 years. And I repeat the fact that there is, that half of the population is children, and that these children have witnessed not one, not two, but sometimes three and four and five wars. And I spit out this word uninhabitable, but I don't necessarily think about what the word uninhabitable means. So before I try to even go there, I want to talk to you about my own background. I grew up in a neighborhood in, the, in occupied Jerusalem called Sheikh Jarrah. And my, my childhood, like many childhoods in Palestine, has been marked by land theft. Settler organizations that are registered in the United States, that are registered as tax exempt, claimed my house as their own by divine decree. And instead of having the local authorities uh, recognize this as absolutely ludicrous and ridiculous, they in fact aided and abetted them. They offered them legal help, they offered them cover, and this is how it was uh, reported on in the media, that there was a real estate dispute between Jewish people and Arabs in this neighborhood called Sheikh Jarrah, where the Arabs were simply evicted. Um, in 2009, I was coming home from school, it was about 10 a.m., and I saw all of our furniture scattered across the length of our street. And you know there weren't many men there because it's 10 a.m. It was mostly like the grandmothers and the older aunts who stay at home, and they were all gathered in our house and they were weeping and they were crying. And I saw, I remember, I saw blood on the ground and I uh, saw that the settlers had threw a big, big TV, one of those old TVs at my grandmother, and she had gone to the hospital. Um, and I saw hundreds of police officers, hundreds of armed settlers. Um, take over half of our home. And this, in the headlines, was reported on as simply an eviction. Now, I'm not trying to imply that evictions are not violent, right? Um, I live in New York City half of the year, and I see how gentrification um, and this kind of eviction uh, wages a lot of violence on black and brown communities. But what I'm trying to say is that eviction does not capture the violent uh, militarism of the forced expulsions that we were facing in Sheikh Jarrah. And this kind of violence that I was subjected to at a very young age and the corresponding erasure from diplomats and media people um, resulted in a lot of pain and a lot of grief and I think above all, a lot of anger, a lot of rage. Um, I came here to the United States when I was 18 to study and I, re I recognized I was a bit different from my peers. I have like very intense emotional reactions to many things. And I thought this was like, you know, characteristic of all people everywhere. But it turns out it was just characteristic of my city. There's a lot of violence exerted on us. And so we are explosive often. And this is just in Jerusalem, right? You have these settler-based organizations, uh, so, sorry, American-based organizations of settlers who uh, cite the Bible and cite God and say that our property is theirs to take, despite um, having lived there our whole lives. And then you grow up and you come to find out that these courts are built 
by settlers to ensure the protection of settlers and to ensure that settlers get as much land as possible. It's like almost like asking the fox to guard the hen house, right? Trying to find justice in the Israeli judiciary. And it wasn't just, it wasn't just um, me. It was all of our neighborhood. And it wasn't just my generation. My grandmother had been displaced from her home in 1948, thrown in the street upon the establishment of the Israeli state. Um, many of her family members were massacred by Zionist militias that later merged and formed what we know now as the Israeli military. Um, and many Palestinians uh, were displaced, 100,000 Palestinians and many were killed, about 15,000 Palestinians were killed, and now we have six million Palestinian refugees around the world. Now, if you take a 10-minute walk from my neighborhood, you go to another neighborhood called uh, Silwan. In Silwan, you have people who are being kicked out of their homes or having their homes demolished because they built their homes without permit. And if you're reading the news, you would think, well, it's unfortunate that they built their homes without permit. It's unfortunate that they're leaving, losing their homes, but they shouldn't have built their homes without permit. What the news will not tell you is that 94% of building permit applications submitted by Palestinians in Jerusalem are rejected. And almost 99% in the West Bank are rejected. What the news will not tell you either is that the very guy that was for many years responsible for accepting and rejecting these permits his name was Yonatan Youssef. He's a prominent settler activist who would march around our neighborhood chanting, we want Nakba now, we want Nakba now, we want Nakba now. And as, as you know, the Nakba is, refers to the uh, violent ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. And so when you compare what happened to my family, our neighborhood, what's continuing to happen in Silwan, and what happened to my, gen my grandmother's generation, you, rec you recognize that the Nakba is an ongoing structure. It wasn't an event. Now, if we want to just take one more example, right? Uh, we can go to, the, to Hebron, to the South Hebron Hills, where Bedouin communities, uh, cave dwellers, have lived there and cultivated their lands for generations. Um, just last year, about 1,300 of them were uh, expelled, or at least the Supreme Court has ruled to expel them. And we are hearing in the past month, excuse me, as the assault on Gaza intensifies. We are hearing in the, in, the, in the last month about more and more villages that are being depopulated in the South Hebron Hills. And again, if you're watching the news, you would read this headline, Palestinians living in a firing zone were evicted from the firing zone. And you would think to yourself, it's unfortunate that these Palestinians were evicted from their homes, but why would they build their homes in a firing zone? And what the news will not tell you is that the Israeli government in the 80s under Ariel Sharon designated their lands as firing zones, as off-limit military zones for the sole purpose of expelling them. And this is not just me speculating, even though I tend to be right often. It's not a conspiracy theory. This has been revealed through declassified documents from the Israeli State Archive that these lands were declared military zones for the sole purpose of expelling Palestinians. And Palestinians in the South Hebron Hills not only face this land theft and dispossession, but they face very brutal settler and military violence. And every other day we hear about a shepherd being killed by a settler. We hear about uh, a, a, you know, uh, a farmer being kill killed by a soldier. In uh, 2022, I was living in uh, Brooklyn uh, with my roommate. I was studying, and I remember I woke up one day, and my roommate, who is from the South Hebron Hills, had just heard the news that her cousin was shot in the neck by the Israeli military, who wanted to take over his electric generator because they were not allowing people to have electric equipment. Um, and they shot him in the neck, and he continues to be paralyzed from the neck down, unable to speak. And these are little stories that contain a magnitude of loss that we hear about every single day. Every, every single day. And seldom do they make the headlines, and if they do make the headlines, they are devout, not just of context. They are often devout of the truth. Um, the kind of displacement 
that I went through in the occupied eastern part of Jerusalem has made me, you know, very fluent in English, but it has also made me flippant. It has made me angry. It has made me has trust issues. I have a lot uh, of, of, you know, mental health issues that I can guarantee you exist across the spectrum in occupied Palestine, right? So everywhere you look on the map, there is a story of dispossession. There is a constant and relentless Nakba that a Palestinian family is being forced to confront often on their own. And people like myself are often forced to turn into one person media ministries where they have to persuade an often hostile TV reporter to believe that you know, the broken arm that I have right here is indeed broken. And the bruise that I have on my neck is indeed real. And that the fact that this family member of mine has been killed was a true story and not a fabrication. And that this footage was not manipulated. And this happens in, in, in against the backdrop of severe demonization of Palestinians, of dehumanization. We are not, we're not just not allowed uh, self-defense or resistance. We are not even allowed a basic human reaction, right? Now, I say, I say all of this to say, to go back to the first point, is that I was born in Jerusalem. And it's only an hour and a half away from the Gaza Strip. And the Gaza Strip, to me, feels like a far away planet. I am the Palestinian, uh, I'm the Palestine correspondent for The Nation magazine. I am culture editor at Mondo Weiss magazine, and I've been wrestling, trying to come up with one article about the matter, trying to fulfill my you know, contractual obligations with my employers, who just texted me right now. Um, <laughs> trying to come up with just one article, trying to summarize what we're seeing, and I cannot, despite the proximity, despite being of the same national background, it's hard to imagine. And I, I want us to consider that a lot of those people who have been writing about the Gaza Strip have been doing so from their expensive apartments. And when they look outside of their windows, there is not white phosphorus, right? They, they write from rooms where the chandeliers never shake, you know, moments before the building trembles and falls and is completely destroyed. They write and they write, they don't write from uh, internet cafes where there are young men who are like haunted by suicidal ideation and aborted potential. They don't write, you know, uh, their children's names on their children's arms, right? And what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say is that we don't, we simply just do not understand. We simply do not know what life inside the Gaza Strip in particular does to a person, what violence, the violence of being besieged begets. We don't know the, the consequences, the material, the muscular, and the mental consequences of, you know, I'll, I'll give you a story. This uh, a Palestinian photojournalist named Ali Zadallah is holding his phone like this, and then he pans his camera to the back seat, and in the back seat, there lies his lifeless father wrapped in a white cloth. And he goes to bury his father by himself, he says, because there are no ambulances and nobody to help with the burial. And then he gets on TV within the next hour to talk to an Egyptian reporter about the fact that his sister still remains under the rubble, but the bulldozer had had to go to another building to try to rescue other people who might be alive. We do not know what goes on in the mind of a nurse whose shift at the hospital is interrupted by the body of her husband or the body of her daughter on a stretcher. We simply do not know. And one of the images that continues to haunt me is the father, is the father that carried what remains of his son in two separate plastic bags, saying, you know, this is my son and this is what remains of him. And you wonder what happens to that father when the cameras are gone? What happens to that father after all of this death? 
what happens what happens to those children that grew up with this horror what becomes of them we have to talk about gaza and within this context and it's not to it's not to like water down anything or justify anything but this is not just a footnote this context is not just a footnote it's not it is material and real and most of us in this room have never experienced it and will never experience it and we cannot just cast it aside this is a place that is governed solely by its severed geography you know people there are encircled by an abundance that in my opinion i think they are owed and what i mean by this is that a lot of these people in gaza two-thirds in fact are refugees who were forced out from the lands where now Israeli settlements and Israeli towns stand. That is not a minor detail. It's also not a minor detail that everybody in the Gaza Strip is a man. I know that sounds like a jarring statement to say, but they are treated as though they are just men. The children are men. The women are men and the girls are men too. They are treated as such by the Israeli military. They are treated as such by Western media. And they are even treated as such within their own self-interpretation because they know that there is no laws of war that apply to them. That they are targeted indiscriminately and often targeted very, very, very intentionally. They all seem, from a sniper's eye view, to be plotting some kind of operation. So it's easy to talk about Gaza, it's easy to talk about the, the geopolitical context and to talk about it and, and to cast it off as this kind of marginal issue. But it's, it's not just a marginal issue. Um, when we say that there's been over 11,000 Palestinians who have been killed in the Gaza Strip by Israeli shelling. It's not just a number. This is a level of loss that we all must contend with. Three, four days ago, um, I joined a group of hundreds of journalists and writers who decided to occupy the lobby of the New York Times building um, in protest of the New York Times complicity in Israel's genocidal war against the Gaza Strip. And they one of the things that they did was they printed a mock New York Times, um, mock New York Times newspaper with the names of the martyrs, right? It took us over an hour and a half to get through the first page, trying to recite the names of, the, of those killed on the first page. And most of them were not even one years old. And when you're reading those names one by one, you, you, there is a physical reaction that forces you to stop and contend with all of this loss, all of these lives that were lost. They're, I know it sounds like a cliche to say, but they are truly not numbers. They are people who had dreams and hopes and flaws and negative qualities and sometimes regressive politics, sometimes amazing progressive politics. Sometimes they were not good people, sometimes they're great people. Sometimes they were just complicated and they deserved life and freedom and liberty and dignity no matter what. This is not a minor detail. So I invite all of you to not cast judgment against the people of Gaza because when you put people in a pressure cooker when you put people in a pressure cooker, they are out to explode. I'm not, a hu I'm not a human rights law expert. I'm not an expert in anything, but I think all of us in this room are expert in one thing, which is natural human reactions. I know that all of us in this room have a very similar answer or, or can imagine a very similar answer to the question that I will pose to you now. Let's just, let's just go with me. Let's just go with my, my story. If somebody, if a foreign military that had no business being in your neighborhood in the first place 
came and took over your home through your family in the street, your furniture in the street, made you, rendered you homeless, forced you to live in the street, and said they did so with divine decree and under the protection and the help of a judiciary, what would you do? Would you not fight back? Now, let's, let's take it up a notch, not to create a hierarchy of, of, of suffering, but I certainly know that if I ever had to go retrieve what remains of my child from the rubble and put him in separate plastic bags, that I will be filled with rage. And how can I not be when the world turns a blind eye to my suffering? How can I not be when all of the rules that apply to everyone do not apply to me? Possibly because we are people of color, because we're Arab, because we're racialized as Muslim, even though not all of us are Muslim. Possibly also because of who our oppressors are and because of the horrors that our oppressors endured, not all of them, obviously, but the horrors that our oppressors endured that the Israeli state then exploits to justify my oppression. How can I, how can I not be horrified? Thank you very much. <laughs>